Welcome. I'm Ryan Merkley, Director of the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder. Thanks for joining us. This session is part of a series of briefings on mis- and disinformation hosted by the Aspen Institute as part of the Commission on Information Disorder. We're talking to experts in the field who can help us make sense of various parts of the information crisis. These are designed as a resource for our commissioners, but also for the broader public. And we hope you find this series informative and useful. We're calling it Disinfo Discussions. In today's conversation, I'm speaking with Ethan Zuckerman. He's an Associate Professor of Public Policy, Communication and Information at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He's the founder of the Institute for Digital Public Infrastructure, a research group that is studying and building alternatives to the existing commercial internet. And he's the author of Mistrust, Why Losing Faith in Institutions Provides the Tools to Transform Them. And that's a topic that we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Ethan. Thank you so much. Just so I don't get in trouble with my university, I have to tell you, we are an initiative for the moment. We hope to be an institute at some point in the future, but uh, one way or another, we are definitely studying digital public infrastructure. And I'm happy to be with you to talk about uh, dis and misinformation. Fantastic. Thanks for the clarification. And I wish you future instituting. Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, let's start with the easy question. How would you define institutional trust? Because I want to spend a bunk, bulk of our time today talking about it. Sure. So I, I just wrote a book called Mistrust, which focuses on a very specific facet of trust. You can think of individuals as having at least three different kinds of trust. There's the trust that we have in our family and our immediate friends. There's trust that we have in random strangers within a society. And then there's trust that we have in institutions. Um, for me, institutions are anything that is sort of big enough that its actions are independent of any specific actor. The idea is that the International Revenue Service, uh, Internal Revenue Service, it shouldn't matter who's running it on any given day. Uh, and in fact, most of us can't come up with the name of the person who's running the Internal Revenue Service. What it is, is a collection of practices, a collection of rules, a collection of ways of doing things that is critical for the functioning of society, but is not something that we can relate to as humans. So the reason to draw the distinction between these things is that if you ask questions about are people becoming more or less mistrustful? You actually have to pull those things apart. There are some societies in which people are very mistrustful of strangers, but highly mistrustful, uh, highly trustful of institutions. In China right now, there's a very low degree of trust in the general public. If you ask people a question that often gets asked for this, which is if you left your wallet in a cafe, what are the chances it would be returned to you? Chinese people, for the most part, will say, I will never see my wallet again. But if you ask people in China, do you trust the government to do the right thing all or most of the time, which is one of the formulations for how people often talk about some forms of institutional trust, the answer there will be very high. In the United States, for instance, it's reversed. We actually have pretty good trust in random strangers, probably lower than we actually should trust. Humans are way more trustworthy than we tend to think we are. But we have very high mistrust in institutions. And in the book that I just finished writing, I looked at the rise of mistrust in institutions over the last 50 years, but particularly um, in this period from 1970 to 1980, where as we shifted from an economy really focused on public goods and government services to an economy that has been primarily a market-driven economy, we have really moved into a much more mistrustful stance vis-a-vis -vis mm. institutions. Um. I want to dig into that a little bit. You, um, in Mistrust, you wrote, it's this loss of trust both in our institutions and in our ability to change our societies that should worry us more than the rise of any specific leader or movement. And I, I want to talk about that because I think you've unpacked it's both the trust and also that, that trust in our ability to change institutions. What does this loss of trust in that context do? What is the impact on society sure. when that happens? Well, so to explain 
um, the context for that. This is a book that I wrote after nine years teaching at MIT in a group called the Center for Civic Media. My students and my collaborators were mostly people who were interested in this concept of how do you use media to make social change. And I got really interested in the idea that most of the people that I was working with rejected wholly or in part what you might call the conventional model of civics. In the conventional model of civics, you vote for people, you put them in office. When they're in office, you petition them or write to them or call them. Maybe occasionally you take to the streets and march. And for the most part, they do your bidding and they pass the legislation that you want them to pass. And what I found was that my students just didn't buy it. And increasingly, as I looked at it, I also didn't buy it. Um, and what I ended up sort of realizing was that I actually had a lot more faith in social movements that in many ways were trying to overturn institutions as a whole, or at the very least to bring them back to their core values. An example of that might be defund the police. There are many communities, particularly communities of color, in which policing has been so aggressive for so long that incremental reform just isn't going to cut it. There's going to have to be a movement to dissolve what's there and to have the community involved with creating something new. So if you don't feel well served by institutions, that's one form of alienation, right? You can sort of look at this and say, these institutions aren't meeting my needs. They're not doing what I need them to do. The real danger is when you feel like you have no ability to change those institutions. When you sort of look at this and say, it doesn't matter who I vote for, Congress is going to be stuck. Um, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, maybe even who I vote for for president, maybe things aren't going to change. That can lead to a level of alienation and disengagement, which is probably fatal to a democracy. And so the question for me is how do you help people at a moment when they don't trust institutions feel a sense of efficacy, feel an ability to make change in the world? And the good news is there's other ways to make change in the world than the standard model of civics. Um, but you have to deal with that question of alienation and people legitimately feeling like the institutions that they have right now are not designed to listen to them or learn from them. I, I want to come back to the um, uh, the concept that that uh, you dig into in the book around uh, insurrectionists and institutionalists a little bit later. As you alluded to that in your answer there, Bad, um, badly chosen words after January sixth. But yeah. uh, I'll explain <laughs> what I'm trying to mean by it when we get you're, to it. You're the single-handedly redeeming the term insurrectionist. It's a, a little bit of a heavy weight for me at this particular <laughs> moment in time, but sure. Um, let's. Um, Hi, that's Barkley. My, that's my dog, Barkley. Um, I want to ask, in the context of mis and disinformation, how that affects and compounds this issue that you're describing. So, um, so let let's start with maybe the simpler version of the case, which is sort of a pre-Trump version of the case. Um, Traditionally, there is mistrust of institutions when you are sort of out of power. So um, if you ask Democrats, do you trust the federal government to do the right thing all or most of the time? When they've got a Democrat in the White House, they have a higher level of trust. When not, you know, when there's a Republican in the White House, lower level of trust, vice versa. Um, there has been at least for 20 years, uh, a gap between Republicans and Democrats as far as confidence in media. And this is a narrative that's been played up really in many ways, starting with Rush Limbaugh, that mainstream media is biased towards the left. It's biased against viewpoints from the right. You can unpack this in many different ways, right? Um, at the end of the day, uh, many people who work for the news industry uh, lean to the left politically uh, and, and probably uh, vote their beliefs. You know, the flip side is that many news organizations uh, work really, really hard to make sure that they're giving as close as they can to an objective fact 
pattern and we can get into all sorts of discussions about whether objectivity is possible or not. One way or another, mistrust in the media has become a right-wing talking point. And then we have Donald Trump. And Trump has weaponized mistrust to the extent that we've never seen in American politics. So um, normally people run as outsiders. That's pretty common. People will show up and say, I'm not part of the system. I'm outside. Even when you have you know, a Bernie Sanders who's been uh, an elected government representative his entire life, uh, they're outsiders. But Trump actually governed as an outsider. He came in and said, don't trust the media, but also don't trust the government. There's a deep state that's fighting against me. Don't trust the Justice Department. Don't trust the FBI. And, you know, that was um, different. Uh, it was a very different approach to governing than we've ever seen before. But what it really did was take, you know, sort of this organic homegrown mistrust, which frankly exists both on the left and on the right. Um, I like to remind people that, um, you know, less than 10 years ago, we had the Occupy movement, where under Obama, we had people who leaned to the left taking to the streets, explaining that late stage capitalism wasn't working and that they didn't buy the system as a whole. Um, that is a pure mistrustful moment. Trump has taken that energy of mistrust, which exists on the left and on the right, particularly as it comes to media and has turned it into fuel for frankly, much of the contemporary Republican party. Um, whose main message right now is is trust nobody and nothing other than some particular individuals. At the end of the day, Trump's message was all the systems are broken. They're all lying to you. Trust me. Um, and that's challenging from a political point of view. It, it also sets up what a lot of scholars are now referring to as the big lie uh, around the 2020 elections which is a moment at which mistrust and which disinformation, right, as distinguished from misinformation, disinformation is intentionally created false information designed for a political purpose. It is a moment at which disinformation becomes central to American politics. Um, that, that takes me, um, it segues actually very nicely into into the next piece I, I want to get into because I think you open by talking about the long history of this decline. Yes. Um, you note in the book uh, that the decline of trust predates the internet, which I think Absolutely. folks have spoken about. Um, but also, you wrote uh, that trust may be harder to recover in an internet age. So I want to talk about both parts of that. First, the decline, yeah. and then the internet's role here on out. Sure. Um, so. Sure. Can you first maybe just briefly describe the decline that we're seeing, how long it's been going on, and, and sure. what you think is driving it? So, so let's talk a little bit in terms of numbers, because it's, it's helpful just to sort of set the scene. So I'm going to use a set of numbers that start from the National Election Survey. They end up being picked up by Gallup polling. But it's a really rich set of data. It's the same question that's been asked over the course of you know, almost 70 years at this point. And, and the question is, do you trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time? And if you asked people this question in 1964, 77% of people would say, yes, I trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time. You ask people now less than 20%, lately the number hovers around 17%. Um, so we've gone from virtually four in five into one in five. But you'd get it wrong if you assume that it's this long, slow, steady decline. You also get it wrong if you assume that everything's great until the internet and then we start trusting nobody. Actually, there's an incredible fall in trust in uh, the 1970s. Um, and it's probably the result of three factors. You have the Vietnam War, uh, where it's increasingly clear that the government is lying to the American people and American invulnerability uh, is being called into question. You have Watergate and Nixon, uh, where suddenly the press grows vastly more aggressive than it had been in pre-Watergate days, um, calling out a president for lying and ultimately um, helping force his resignation. 
Uh, and then you have poor Jimmy Carter, uh, who has the three problems of stagflation and energy crisis and the Iran hostage crisis, all of which leads confidence to go to stunningly low levels. So if you ask people in 1980, at the end of Carter's presidency, you have 26 percent of people saying they trust the government all or most of the time. So then we get Reagan and Reagan is a really pivotal figure because Reagan comes in with a very new vision of what government could and should be. In the post-war period, pre-Reagan, there is a sense that the government should be building infrastructure, should be investing heavily in education. We have things like LBJ's war on poverty. We really have a vision driven by public goods. Reagan and Thatcher come in and essentially say, that's not what government's good for. Government is best when it governs least. Trust the markets. And that philosophy, now referred to as neoliberalism, has really dominated since the 1980s. What that philosophy has led to is some interesting things. Enormous economic growth, but concentrated in the most wealthy. Um, huge increases in inequality. Um, so the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest um, has changed really radically. Mm -hmm. The other thing it's done is it's hollowed out government. And so government really has become less competent than it used to be. Uh, but this is something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you ask government uh, not to govern and you systemically starve it of resources, it does not do as well as it does when you recruit the best and the brightest and uh, spend enormous amounts of money on it. So at this point, mistrust in institutions, which by the way, mistrust is not just in the federal government. We've seen rising mistrust in everything from the healthcare system, the church, banks, big business, you name it, we trust it less. That seems in my mind to do with the combination of rising inequality, the fact that for most Americans, their actual day-to-day -day living is probably less hopeful and less optimistic than it was 40 or 50 years ago, and actual failures of these infrastructures, which people then have a hard time forgetting and forgiving. And then along comes the internet. And, and then how, along comes the internet. And how is the internet either hastened or sustained that decline or prevented its recovery in your view? So, so let's take the media-centric theory on this. A media-centric theory on this doesn't start with the internet. It starts with talk radio. Um, so up until the early 1980s, we have the fairness doctrine at work in the United States. If you're going to put someone with a strong political opinion on the air, you're going to have to provide right of response and equal time for someone to come up with another opinion. Fairness doctrine disappears under Reagan. We start seeing the emergence of figures like Rush Limbaugh, who are not presenting a fair and balanced picture of the world. Rush is giving a very personal, very opinionated view of the world from a right-wing perspective. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be phenomenally profitable. It is an engine for minting money and it's incredibly successful in shaping the direction of the Republican Party. Fox News follows along with this model. Uh, it turns out to be successful in its own right. And those things both precede the internet. And research done by my dear friend and colleague, Yochai Benkler, suggests that those things might still actually be much more influential than the internet. Um, that in terms of actual sort of agenda setting for U.S. politics, you just can't underestimate the power of Fox News. It's been mm -hmm. incredibly powerful. And he's got a brilliant uh, book called Network Propaganda that looks at the 2016 elections and the ways in which Fox News changes opinions. The Internet, however, has become the input channel into these media ecosystems. So because it's possible for people to publish and share information, a lot of that information can get upcycled into this sort of more broadcast, more broad reaching media. <clears throat> so it's not that the internet doesn't have an influence. It has two primary influences. The first is that it makes it much, much easier 
for broadcasters, whether they're television broadcasters, whether they're newspapers, to get a wider range of ideas. And often this wider range of ideas is really great. Uh, for all we might have appreciated from the media of the 1970s, not a lot of people of color, not a lot of women, not a lot of LGBTQ people. Um, so the fact that we're getting more input is incredibly positive. Mm. But when you have these highly partisan amplifiers, it gives you a diverse range of far right talking points that can sort of get amplified. The second thing it does is it makes it possible for people who don't trust those broadcasters or who don't trust some of those broadcasters to go and do their own research. And their own research, unfortunately, is usually limited to the first thing in Google search results that meets their pre-existing point of view. Uh, there's lots of neuroscience out there that suggests that for all we like to think of ourselves as rational animals convinced by facts, the truth is our brains are lawyers and they look at a set of findings and they try to pick out the one that best supports their argument. And the internet supercharges that. Um, so you can look up whatever topic you want. If you get a diversity of opinion, you can gravitate towards the ones that confirms your biases. And that allows people um, to approach things with a sense of being informed because they've done the work of doing their own research, but what they've really done is the work of confirming biases. Hmm. Um, it leads to the sort of divide that, that I, wanna, I wanna follow into now. And I mentioned it earlier when you, you talked about insurrections insurrectionists and institutionalists. You write in the book, uh, mistrust has activated conservatives and disillusioned liberals. And you describe a kind of segmentation uh, where you talk about insurrectionists and institutionalists. And also you, in the last chapter, add Eli Pariser's resurrectionists suggestion. Can you talk a little bit about that segmentation and the divide and why folks in various parts of the political spectrum have responded differently to mistrust? Yeah. So for, first of all, whenever you're naming something, just ask Eli first, right? You know, <laughs> e Eli wrote a very thoughtful book on echo chambers and polarization, uh, but he coined the term the filter bubble and, you know, now sort of owns that conversation. Um, so uh, th there's something to be said for, for having a gift for naming. And, and um, I like res resurrectionism a, a lot. So um, I stole from Chris Hayes this idea that understanding contemporary politics, it's not super helpful just to look in terms of left and right. Um, that just in terms of sort of questions of how much should the state be involved with the economy and you know what's the state's role in private life, that those are not necessarily all that helpful. You need a second axis to understand, which is institutionalist and insurrectionist. Institutionalists, in this set of terms, are people who believe that you make change through institutions. So if you want to make change in the world, go to law school, join a Senate campaign, work in a senator's office, and then eventually run for local office, and maybe someday you'll be part of the federal lawmaking apparatus, right? That's the institutionalist path. The insurrectionist path looks at this and says, have, have you seen these institutions lately? They're not working really well. And either says, look, we either need to radically reform these things, tearing them down to their foundations and building them back up. We need to bulldoze them and build something entirely new in their path. Or we need to be like actively involved with combat to pressure these institutions to get them to straighten up and fly right. The truth is you can have insurrectionists on the left and on the right. So Occupy is a left insurrectionist movement. Um, you can have left insurrectionists even within contemporary politics, right? So in um, 2016, in the Dem primary, you have Hillary Clinton, who is a left institutionist, right? You know, former Secretary of State, understands how the system works, it's gonna work within the system, run against Bernie Sanders, who's a left insurrectionist, hey, we actually have to throw out our entire American system of healthcare, build a new institution in its place around state-managed healthcare. That's a classic insurrectionist take. Trump does the same thing on the right. 
Jeb Bush, you know, has gone to all the right schools, has the right pedigree, has the right heritage, right institutionalist. And then you have Trump showing up and saying, I don't trust any of these things. Trust me, I know business and I'm a bazillionaire, right insurrectionist. So those four quadrants actually define American politics much, much better than just left and right at this point. It's gotten trickier because you've now had mistrust so heavily weaponized that there is now a branch of the far right who believe that Trump literally was calling them to tear down the entirety of the American electoral system. And that is the way that we now use the term insurrectionists. We had people literally committing acts of insurrection. Really hard to know that was going to happen when I wrote this book. And uh, you can imagine it's really tough when you have a book that comes out on January 20th, when there is a literal insurrection in the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Uh, Not what I was expecting to deal with instead of trying to explain these things. I think the comment that I would make about those insurrectionists is that when I'm celebrating insurrection, I am really celebrating people who have been fighting to fix broken institutions for decades. And so I look at something like the Movement for Black Lives, which is now developing the defund the police critique. And for me, that's insurrection at its best. That's looking at an institution and saying, look, we can document over decades the ways in which this institution has failed us and the ways in which institutional approaches to fixing it have failed. The insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol are coming from a very different point of view. They're coming from the point of view of listening to one person who claims that all the other institutions are lying to you. Everything from the House of Representatives through the electoral process, through the lying mainstream media, who are you gonna believe, me or, or your lying eyes? And that weaponized mistrust, which Trump did so skillfully during the five years of campaign and time in power where he really dominated the media cycle, that's where he's able to sort of bring that other vision of insurrection to the fore. You know, the other side of that coin is that Trump so skillfully activated a fear in those folks. If you, if you listen to the, the video or watch the video of, of the insurrection, you see there is a real belief in the minds of those people who stormed the Capitol and a fear uh, of, of, that has been stoked in them. And I, I want to ask about, are there parts of trust that are more important than others? And I'm interested in your thoughts in particular around the role of fear and safety yeah. uh, in helping people overcome those barriers yeah. to trust. So here's where it gets so tricky, right? We know in retrospect that a lot of those people who stormed the Capitol had been under intense economic stress uh, and that a large number of the people who've been identified as participating in the riot are are people who have had substantial financial problems, bankruptcy, so on and so forth. Um, And I have argued that rising inequality, which is affecting people both on the left and on the right, is perhaps the core issue that's generating mistrust in one fashion or another. Hmm. What's hard is sort of distinguishing between mistrust that's developed through long experience and mistrust that is is whipped up for benefit. So um, there is a popular talking point right now that America's urban areas are completely lawless free fire zones. You'll remember this from um, Portland, Oregon, which depending on who you listen to had fallen into complete anarchy um, uh, last fall. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think if you look at the rental market in Portland, you'll find that uh, at least the market seems to suggest that um, that I, either anarchy never came or that it's actually highly desirable. Um, I think for the most part, most fact-based accounts would tell you that 
um, there's actually been a remarkably little, not no, but little violence associated with uh, movement for black lives or the protests for racial justice, so on and so forth. So there's ways in which fear can absolutely be whipped up and manipulated. That doesn't discount the fact that there is real fear and real disaffection going on. And that's what's so complicated about weaponizing mis and disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, very little disinformation is purely created ex nihilo, right? The sort of Macedonian style of let's make something up and I bet the Americans will click on it. That's surprisingly uncommon. What is much more common is interpretation of events and an interpretation that, um, you know, the objective fact, there were protests in Minneapolis and windows got broken um, versus Minneapolis is a lawless hell because police are afraid to do their jobs versus uh, there was a righteous anger around George Floyd's murder. Those are interpretive, right? And those can be mobilized for activation on the left and on the right. An enormous amount of what's going on in terms of mis and disinformation is more about that mobilization and activation and interpretation than it is about differences in fact patterns. Um, but, you know, if we actually want to deal with this question of mis and disinformation, one of the first things we have to do is understand that this is a political question, not just an informational question. Yeah. I want to come back to your, your point a moment ago about scope and, and as you kind of alluded to scope and scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's certainly been one of the other talking points. We certainly heard it in the, in the Senate hearing just yesterday. Um, the, that the scope and scale of the platforms, the groups they enable, uh, the ways that they make it easier to amplify reach contribute to the, uh, to these, uh, to amplifying or augmenting the challenge. And um, I want to reference the piece that Zoe Carpenter wrote in The Nation last week, where she talks uh, a little bit with you or quotes you briefly and talks about far right social media yep. and says that you know, there's a case to be made uh, for digital infrastructure that is smaller more distributed and not for profit as a path to a better yeah. internet. And yeah. in this context, it seems like a relevant place to ask you about that. Sure, so, so let's talk about two theories of why social media might be dangerous. So the first theory we're gonna call the rabbit hole theory and we're gonna attribute it to uh, Kevin Roos who's given a particular, um, he, he's done a very attractive job of sort of explaining it through anecdote and through very strong reporting. The theory behind the rabbit hole th approach is that people who are maybe a little lost, but largely apolitical, find themselves looking for content online that might even be around things like self-improvement. Jordan Peterson, you know, get yourself together, do a better job of, of being a good person and, and working hard and find themselves pulled into increasing depths of extremism. And while Roos makes a, a, a really good storytelling case on this, some of the research that's been done on this doesn't support the rabbit hole theory particularly well. Um, academic research that's looked at recommendation on YouTube um, suggests that it's actually very hard to get from innocuous content into extremist content. Probably the best work that's been done on this recently um, was done by uh, Brendan Nyhan with uh, the Anti-Defamation League. And they have a new report out which actually looked at uh, more than a thousand users and looked at their YouTube viewing. And what they basically found was, yeah, a small number of people end up consuming a lot of hateful content, um, but they were pretty hateful to start with. They were people who at the beginning of the survey, if you asked them their opinions on race, would have given you um, answers that were we would consider them conventionally racist. Um, and it's a small percent of the sample, it's about 3%, and they watch pretty much all the hateful content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So this theory, 
basically says what the internet has done is made it far easier for the racists to find each other. Um, and that seems hard to argue with. We talk a lot about radicalization on YouTube. We talk about far right social networks like Gab and Parler. Stormfront still exists. You can find the uncut pure Nazism, right? Absolute straightforward white nationalism uh, just by entering the right URL, which I'm not gonna say. Um, and, and that exists online. The trick is most people don't go to Stormfront because most people don't say, hey, I wanna think you know, what the Nazis are thinking. So the rabbit hole theory is very concerning because it implies that exposure to this stuff can drive us all to the right. Um, you should still be concerned about the, it's easier for the hateful people to find each other because there's enough hateful people out there already and being able to find each other can make them more powerful. It also has a way of normalizing views. So if these two theories are true, and like I said, I'm a little suspicious of the rabbit hole theory, one way to go about this is to say, what if we didn't have such an emphasis on social networks for 3 billion people? Um, what if instead of the dominant mode of social networking, was one in which we were all members of dozens of different communities. I might be a member of a local social network for the small town I live in. I might be a member of essentially a support group for type one diabetes, which I have. Maybe I would be a member of a network for geocaching, which is a hobby of mine. You know, take a dozen different things. That sort of experience of interacting with a whole bunch of smaller social networks, each of which has a topic and a purpose, could make it a lot easier to govern these spaces. And in fact, the users of those spaces could be involved with governing those spaces. Making decisions about what's allowable speech on Facebook, that's just hard because Facebook is for everything. Um, making decisions about what's allowable content on a diabetes support group, uh, that's actually a lot easier. Uh, is your topic about diabetes? No, well, then it probably shouldn't happen within this, right? Go find another space where that happens. One of the side effects of this sort of highly distributed vision of social media, which is part of what I'm working on in my lab at UMass, is that um, you're going to end up with communities that look like Stormfront. You're going to end up with radical communities. And people who are looking for that material are going to find it here's two responses to that. The first one is, yeah, and that's what happens today. Uh, you already have the stormfronts out there. And as long as we're in a country that has very strong free speech protections, they're gonna continue to exist. Second, if there is any truth to the rabbit hole theory, this is a great way to counter it because you're no longer stumbling from innocuous content on YouTube into potentially highly harmful content on YouTube. You were instead deciding to go and join these sort of extreme communities. In many ways, this was what was so worrisome and powerful about when QAnon moved from 8chan into Facebook and YouTube. Um, 8chan continues to exist. It is the sort of place that when you go there, you pretty much know what you're getting into. You know that you are wading chest deep into a cesspool. Um, but on YouTube or Facebook, you might find yourself encountering, if not QAnon, then certainly vaccine, Mr. Disinformation, and you're getting it kind of where you live, right in your home. Having fewer of these giant general interest networks and having much more conscious choice over what conversations am I having and where might actually be one way of trying to deal with these sort of mis and disinfo problems. So we've talked about the, the platforms a little bit. And I, as we start to wind down, I've got a couple of final questions. Um, I want to turn back to uh, government and some of the, the leading sectors like science and journalism that are struggling with a trust deficit. And I want to invite you um, to offer any suggestions or steps that you might take if you were trying to help them rebuild and then retain 
yeah. trust uh, if you were yep. government or science or, or journalism or, or any other of those, those institutions or sectors that we rely on. So let me let me try my best at a clickbait headline. <laughs> Here's one simple trick to regain trust in institutions. And, and of course, the problem with it is that um, it's not a trick and it's not simple. Um, but the answer is this, the more participatory an institution is, the higher a chance it has of being trusted. So um, the more an institution opens itself up to you being a functioning member and particularly a governing member, the better a chance it has of being trusted, right? One thing that was really fascinating in 2020, there was all sorts of misinformation about the elections are gonna be rigged, they're gonna be stolen. You had many, many people get involved with election monitoring who had not been involved with it before. And almost to a person, they came out of the process going, it's actually really hard to rig a US election. It's pretty thoughtfully put together. It's pretty carefully done. And yeah. frankly, the amount of havoc that you could wreak at one polling place is pretty darn modest. Um, the fact that it is so distributed, the fact that it is so thoughtfully put together, hard to rig an election. Uh, one of the favorite stories that I share in the Mistrust book is my friend Luigi Reggi. Reggi starts his career as an Italian bureaucrat. He's responsible for open data about EU cohesion funds. And being a smart guy, he creates this beautiful data portal that wins all these awards for you know uh, showing where, where EU funds go in Italy. No one uses it, has no impact. So he starts leading people in what he calls monothons. These are based on the model of a hackathon, but rather than hacking a new piece of code, they go to monitor an institution. They go and visit a project that's been built with EU cohesion funds. They ask a very tough set of questions. They investigate, they look at the timeline, they look at who it serves. And what happens 95% of the time is people come out of it and go, huh, people spent these funds really carefully and really, really well. It's been so good for increasing confidence in Italian government. It's now routinely used as part of people's senior high school civics projects. They require civic students to go out instead of do monothon. So the simple trick is give people insight into what your institution actually does, make them part of the work. And if you can do it, give them decision-making power within the work. Um, my friends Eli Pariser and Talia Stroud did a survey recently of heavy social media users. And they basically said, for whatever platform you are a heavy user of, tell me whether this platform works for you. Tell me whether it gives you the tools that you need to do whatever you want to do on it, really feel like you can make an impact. The one that won running away was Reddit. Why does Reddit win? Reddit is actually run by its community. Reddit is the seventh largest site in terms of traffic in the United States. It's ahead of LinkedIn, it's ahead of Instagram, it's ahead of Wikipedia, it's way ahead of Twitter. It has 400 employees. The reason it's able to do that is it has tens of thousands of unpaid moderators. And those moderators are responsible for topic-based communities. And within those topic-based communities, they have an enormous amount of control over what goes or what doesn't go they have quite a bit of trust in their communities and in the larger infrastructure and the people who use that network have that trust as well. So my one easy trick for fixing trust is take your institution and figure out how to restructure it so the people that it's serving can see its insides, can take part in its working and preferably can even take a leadership role in it. Now, the hard part is actually figuring out how you do that within most institutions, but that is the answer to the question. Uh, you mentioned uh, civics in your answer, so I, I have to go back to, um, there's a section in the book where you talk, you know, a couple of points where you talk about education. Um, so a, a lot of folks have suggested that one of the solutions we should be looking to here is education uh, on civics, on media literacy, you talk a little bit about that in the book, both how it improves belief in the system, but how also in some cases it diminishes it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on where education sure. fits in this in this set of solutions? 
civic educators use a concept called efficacy. And what we mean by this is how able is someone to make the change in the world that they want to see. And we pull this apart into two ideas. We pull this apart into internal and external efficacy. Internal efficacy basically means, do you have the tools that you need to make change in the world? Um, do you know how laws get passed? Do you know how to give a public speech? Do you know how to write to your legislators, et cetera, et cetera? External efficacy is how willing those systems are to change. So where these terms come into play is, is often in describing the civil rights movement. When you look at civil rights protesters in the American South in the early 1960s, these are people who have intense internal efficacy. You look, I, I give the, the example in the book of the March on Washington. The March on Washington is planned and designed to the level of sandwich toppings. The sandwiches distributed to marchers at the March on Washington have mustard instead of mayonnaise because they're afraid that mayonnaise will go bad and lead to food poisoning in the heat, so they've got mustard. When you're talking about people who are figuring out sandwich toppings in protests, these are people who actually have pretty high internal civic efficacy. They know who they're protesting, they know where, they know how, they know how to, to make their point. They're very low external efficacy because the American South in the early 1960s does not want to change and the entire power structure is designed to shut down this dissent not just within the government even within the churches you look at some of the mainline churches who are criticizing reverend king for these marches and you sort of realize how incredibly difficult it was to sort of make those changes so my theory on this would be a whole lot of people sort of say well what's wrong with america right now is that america's youth have no knowledge of civics. What they actually mean is they have low internal civic efficacy. They can't tell you the difference between the three branches of government, so on and so forth. That may be true, um, but they also in many cases have very low external efficacy. They know that these systems are quite broken, that they don't actually work the way that we say they do. And when you look at other ways to make change, sometimes they actually have intense internal civic efficacy. I'm really interested in movements that are trying to change norms first and then laws. One of the theories of the book is that it's easier to change laws once you've changed norms. Uh, again, different during the civil rights movement. Uh, you actually have the Supreme Court making decisions on things like interracial marriage that are way more progressive than mainstream America. These days around something like equal marriage for LGBTQ people, you see public opinion 20 years ahead of where the courts are. So right now you see people building movements like Black Lives Matter or Me Too. These are norms-based movements. They are not first and foremost trying to change laws. They're trying to change minds and hearts. And that may be a, pe a place where young people are way more efficacious than we give them credit for. So when it comes to the space of mis and disinformation, one of the things that I worry about is, is that telling people to educate the youth is just way too easy, right? It's, it's the simple answer. Oh, if we just give people media literacy education, it's going to solve everything. First of all, Dana Boyd points out the last time we tried to give kids internet media literacy education, we told them not to trust Wikipedia. And so what they did instead was went to Google and found whatever results made them happy, whether or not they were authoritative. But beyond that, we actually know from studies that mis and disinformation is not primarily shared by young people. It's primarily shared by people over 65. It's probably more of a Fox News phenomenon than it is an Instagram phenomenon, just thinking sort of generationally beyond this. But beyond this, the reason that we advocate for this is that mis and disinformation is no longer a technical problem. It's no longer an informational problem. It's a political problem. Miss and disinformation has become a central political strategy of the Republican Party. And we are at a point where when we talk about miss and disinformation, we have to wrestle with the fact that 70% of Republican members of the House supported actions that would have overturned free and fair elections. 
and that at least 50, sometimes as high as 70% of Republicans polled in the US today, believe that the 2020 elections were stolen, despite the fact that that is patently false. The Republican parties had all sorts of opportunities to disclaim this. They could have said, that's what Trump was doing, but we're not gonna do that anymore. They have not. So we can try all we want to educate people to figure out what's a more believable or less believable piece of information. But right now, a lot of that unbelievable information is coming from Republican members of Congress. And that's not something that we can tackle purely from a technological or an informational point of view. Ethan, that's a great place to, to end the questions, but I want to give you the last word uh, to the commission. Uh, these briefings are intended, as we said, to inform yeah. members of our commission as they're right now thinking about where they want to focus their priorities as they build their recommendations. Yeah. Are there, is there, uh, is there advice or any recommendations you want to give to them as they think about where their priorities of focus should be as they come up with solutions for government, the private sector, and civil society? I've had the pleasure of sitting on two of these commissions recently, once as a staffer, once as a participant. Um, the Knight Foundation uh, led an excellent commission on trust. Uh, I served on the AAAS commission uh, that was looking at revitalization of democratic and civic life. Um, misinformation was a big focus of both of those. I think one thing I would urge you to look at is to look more broadly than solving the problem of how do we remove mis or disinformation from online platforms. Um, that's not an easy question. Uh, it's actually really hard to do that in a way that's fair and viable and scalable, but it's a tiny, tiny part of what you actually need to look at. Um, you need to look at this much broader question of how is mis and disinformation being used um, in American politics and American civic life. It's become a mainstream in our civic discourse. You also have to look at larger questions of how do people feel like they can be effective in participating in American civic life. And a lot of that participation is going to be online. That is simply where a lot of these conversations happen these days. And frankly, it's not a bad place to be having these conversations. But what we really need to think about is not just the content of those conversations, how much of it is misinformation, but are those conversations really helping people achieve their ends of making a better world? As long as people feel disempowered, and incapable of making change, as long as people feel like there is an advantage from making change through making people more fearful through mis and disinformation, that will continue to happen. What you really need to take, and I regret to inform you this because it makes your job much, much harder, is you really have to take a very broad look at what it means to be a civic actor in America right now. And you really have to ask that question of, if you were one of my brilliant 23 year old students at UMass and you wanted to, you know, really shape the world, how would you go about doing it today? It's probably not by working on a senatorial campaign. It might be working in Silicon Valley. It might be becoming an Instagram influencer. And as much as that sounds silly, that's actually where some of the real movement power is sort of coming from this. So I would just challenge you to sort of let go of what you think of as how civics is supposed to work and think about how civics is actually working today and have that be a starting point for the work that you're doing on the commission. Oh, that's a great way to finish. Ethan, thank you so much for giving us oh, the time for your insights. Um, I've been a big admirer of your work for a long time. I think of you as one of the better angels of the internet. So thank you so very much. Uh, and this has been a real pleasure. So thank you. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.